First thing I should say is the word disregard comes at the end of this uh, title. For uh, <coughs> complex reasons, uh, uh, it used to say uh, the empirics of uh, veil lifting. Then we added British because we were giving papers in places that weren't the UK. Uh, and then we had lots of discussions in each of the uh, seminars about whether veil lifting was a general term, whether it was a specific thing, what do the judges mean when they say veil lifting, do they mean piercing, and we got into, before we even got to give the paper, really, we were getting caught up in definitions of what the umbrella term would be. So to avoid uh, us getting caught up, it now says, the empirics of corporate disregard, which of course means that uh, is what I would call, in an old-fashioned way, veil lifting. That's what we're going to look at today. Um, this is a, a paper, Brian said, uh, mentioned that myself and um, uh, that I was part of this project looking at um, co uh, corporations around the world as part of this Sloan Foundation uh, uh, project. I met Peter O as part of this project and we both ended up giving similar papers on the same day in a conference but from very different perspectives and, and very different approaches to it. And over a sort of year afterwards, we had a correspondence and, and decided that we would sort of combine the papers and try and do uh, an empirical study of uh, veil lifting in the UK. Now, um, the reason we wanted to do that is that there's a, a, a lot of scholarship on uh, veil lifting or corporate disregard in the UK. Uh, these, are four, these are sort of four main categories. I'll just briefly go through these. Uh, so you get an idea of why you, we might have wanted to do uh, an empirical study. Uh, the first one is the sort of latest cases. Unusually in an area of scholarship, there's a sort of tradition of big figures in the area writing case notes on an important development. And these cases, case notes form a, a sort of a, a signpost for the future uh, and they sort of occur regularly throughout the, the literature from the 1920s onwards. Then there's a sort of more traditional scholarship in looking at cases in historical context, what, what they might mean over time. Uh, then there's a third category, what I call the golden thread, which is arguments that somewhere in this literature there is a golden thread. The judges really are consistent in the way they apply this stuff. The more successful papers in that golden thread part take a particular area and um, look at is there consistency within it uh, to see, you know, can we see uh, a, this golden thread. There, there are some very big picture ones which uh, are more, I think it's much more difficult to put a, a sort of golden thread on it because the case law is so messy. Um, then there's a fourth one which is it's, uh, it's all a mistake. Um, uh, the House of Lords decision in Solomon was a terrible mistake. Uh, Paddy Arlen has argued that, Mark Moore, who's here, has argued that as well, you know, that it's a sort of faulty foundation and it's, it, that's why none of this works, that's why it's all a, a terrible mess. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think, you know, it's a foundational area of, of company law, but as someone who's taught company law for a long, long time now, it is really difficult to put a, a sort of shape on this stuff. And I realised recently, and more, more particularly because I was talking to Peter O, who's a a sort of empiricist, that what we argue about are very few cases. At most, if we took a major article, what are we talking about, 30 cases, maybe at most 50 cases, uh, that we've decided ourselves, because of our skill sets as lawyers, are the most important cases. But if you step back from it and, and look at the mass of cases, are we really making that choice? Or are we just picking what other people have, have done? There's a sort of flaw in the, the sort of legal scholarship that we wanted to address. So it's sort of instinct skill aimed at peers and repeating other people's work. Um, and, and I think the evidence is weak within the literature. Um, and there really is a mess in the, in the case law, which makes it even more complex to get a, a sort of handle on this stuff. So Peter and myself decided we would do uh, a big empirical study, or as big as we could, uh, on this. So. Um, uh, but there is a fifth category, which is um, empirical work. It's surprising within the UK context that there isn't more empirical work. But uh, there is one big um, uh, empirical study, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, Charles Mitchell's study in 1999. Um, 
The, before I come to that, though, I need to mention the American scholarship, because what's surprising is, given the UK uh, has not got much empirical work, uh, in the US there's lots of it, uh, stimulated by Robert Thompson's work in 1991. Uh, the headline in that study was that the uh, US judiciary uh, lift the veil more in contract than in tort, and that caused a, a sort of uh, explosion in commentary around this, and an explosion in, in empirical work around uh, veil lifting. Uh, my co-author Peter Rowe has done a, a large empirical study uh, in which he didn't find that. He did a, a, with a different methodology, he didn't say, find the same outcome. Um, Charles uh, Mitchell in 1999 um, partially repeated the, or adopted the methodology of Thompson and did a study in uh, the UK. Um, he didn't include fraud, just some of the things to note about Mitchell's study was he um, didn't include fraud as a, 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 a sort of a, a substantial part of the study. He didn't look at rationales as Thompson had. Thompson had looked at rationales, what, you know, the reasons why they had um, lifted the veil. Charles didn't do that. And Charles also um, counted multiple decisions in the same case, which is um, there are good reasons for doing that, but there are, problem there are problems with it, which I'll come to in a moment. And Charles found, the same as Bob Thompson, uh, that there was a, a, a greater rate of disregard with, reg with regard to um, uh, contract over tort. Charles's study, though, didn't have the effect, surprisingly, uh, that Thompson's did in stimulating a great debate about this and repeats of studies. Um, so partly one of the reasons we were coming back to it was that we think that there should be more empirical work in this area. Um, and to relook at Charles, Charles's work, and Charles has been incredibly helpful to us in um, developing our uh, uh, data set for this. So this is what we did: um, uh, various sources. Um, uh, we also Charles let us check against his data set as well of cases. Um, so the timeline goes back way, way back, but. Really, there's only significant cases from the uh, late 19th century onwards, as, as you'd expect. There were the searches. This is what we got um, from all that, was 748 uh, published and unpublished uh, uh, cases. Uh, we went through that for relevancy. There's an absolute ton of irrelevant stuff, as you might imagine, um, uh, and got down to things that you would say 456. They, these, are, these do contain some veil lifting, some piercing. Uh, but really what we wanted to do was get something that was, at, at its core, this case was about a choice that the judiciary had to attribute liability to the shareholders. And so we, we went through that and got down to 185. Um, that, Charles's study has 290 decisions, but they're multiple decisions. So. Uh, Solomon, for example, would count in his study as three uh, decisions. Um, so Charlton's data set is actually about the same size uh, our one is in the end, and except the big difference is ours is we only um, register the final decision. So if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court or the House of Lords, that's the decision we take in it. Um, uh, because we think that's a better way of getting a picture of uh, the law at the position as it went along. Now, the reason Charles took multiple decisions uh, was that he wanted to get a sense of the tensions and patterns within the different levels of the court, uh, which we were interested in as well, but we didn't want it to conflict with the, the general study of the patterns over time. So we've approached it in a different way by looking at the judiciary and then looking separately at the tensions between the courts which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, we also included fraud as a substantive claim, which is the, the sort of controversial difference in the uh, different empirical studies on um, veil lifting. The reason why we've done that is that there is a substantial literature that argues broadly that looking for anything consistent in the, the decisions on this uh, it isn't going to work because it is really, really messy. The only thing you'll find that's really determining this is whether there's an element of fraud in these cases. And so fraud has, has built up as a sort of 
uh, as part of the literature. And so we've included it in this in two ways, in terms of looking at claims of fraud and then rationales uh, that the judiciary um, uh, use based around fraud. Um, we don't have multiple decisions. We also look at the courts and their affirmation rates um, uh, or overturnings. Um, and we look at the judges as well. We looked at who the judges are, when they were appointed, um, how many times they sat in uh, cases in our database. So we got a sort of quite rich picture of patterns over time. Okay, let's go look at uh, what we actually found. So in the total data set, this is what we found. Um, a, a strong tendency to uh, not disregard, as you might expect. Um, it doesn't really tell us much because it's over a very long time period. Uh, what does tell us a lot, and what's at the heart of it, is um, a decade uh, study. Now, uh, let me explain this graph. The, the red bars and this side are the number of cases uh, in each decade. The um, uh, disregard rates are the blue this. Um, you can see from this, in terms of a historical narrative, the Solomon uh, uh, precedent weighs very heavily on this, or I'd argue it weighs heavily on just the number of cases in the system. Uh, there's so few cases here that this is largely meaningless. Um, you know, there's just not enough decisions for us really to be able to say much about this, other than the, the House of Lords decision and the rules of the Supreme Court as it, as it operates up until 1966 weigh heavily on the decision making. Now, if we add in that line, which is to represent um, the changes in the rules of civil procedure in um, 1966, where the House of Lords agreed effectively to allow itself to overturn previous decisions, we think there's an effect on the, um, the way the cases play out. Uh, there's an explosion in cases, really, um, uh, from that period onwards, in the late 60s into the 70s, and it, it continues on afterwards. But that initial period, there seems to be a connection, or we'd argue there's a connection between those changes and the, uh, the cases that arise. Um, we also have enough numbers at that point to start to see uh, real patterns within the, uh, the data. So um, we see a rise in the case that numbers for the 70s and 80s, but we see a sort of, over those two decades, a sort of surprising, if you read the scholarship on this area, particularly in the 80s, there's a sort of hysterical <coughs> scholarship here. Uh, that is saying it's out of control, there's too much disregard, nobody can rely on uh, corporate form anymore. Um, and that partly was one of the, the sort of rationales behind the, the um, Adams decision. So if we add that in there, um, that's Adams and Cape Industries. Um, it was often <laughs> described as a sort of reaction to what was going on in the case law in the the 80s, or it's a sort of <coughs> policy decision, um, but it is a difficult decision. It's a, a sort of complex, but I, I think it's badly argued and reasoned. Its historical analysis is poor. There's lots of reasons for seeing it as a sort of policy reaction. Um, uh, it does cause a reaction. Uh, if you look right after it, there's two things. One is, unsurprisingly, the uh, disregard rates go down given that you have a Court of Appeal decision that seems to close off uh, most of the avenues that have been open for uh, veil lifting up until that point. We're left with three that are quite difficult to uh, apply. Uh, disregard rate goes down, but look, the actual number of cases explodes in this period. Um, now, we've given this paper in front of a range of audiences, and it's been the practitioners that have been the most sort of interested in in that, and the ones who have been sort of least surprised by that, partly because um, the dark heart of any of these empirical studies on uh, uh, veil lifting or, or anything to do with patterns in the court is that we do not have the settlement data. We just don't know what gets settled, um, and nobody does. And we, uh, from my reading of the literature on settlement, 
about 19, they, re, they estimate 99% are, are settled. So there's a huge amount of settlement goes on. The practitioners all said, oh yes, that's what happens when you get uh, an extreme decision, something that comes and closes off an area. You then remove settlement from the possibility. So the litigation goes up because you have to choose either to fight or flight. You have to do one or the other. You can't make a tactical decision here. Um, the other thing that they've said has been um, that actually practitioners in the area have a good view of what the real rates are, regardless of the academic sort of hysteria, uh, or even that the judiciary might feel that things are out of control. Um, the, the decisions in the 1980s, particularly if you look before Adams, uh, there are a number of court of appeal decisions that go one way, that go the other way. There's a lot of uncertainty in that period. And so um, it's not clear at the time, just after Adams, that this is going to stick at all. Another court of appeal decision might have changed it. So um, these litigation, the number of cases explodes. And we don't really know why, but these are the sort of explanations that we've been working around. Uh, and then we have an unusual thing happen. Uh, the cases continue to go up, um, but there's a transformation in the disregard rates. They get very high in the uh, decade after. Uh, so it's a decade of it comes down, and then there's a decade at the beginning of the 20th century, our final decade in the study, that it really goes way, really high. Um, we were concerned about this because we're not sure why, but when we start to look at the judicial data uh, and generational changes in the judiciary, there may be an explanation in here about the reactions that are occurring both in the 80s um, after Adams and then in this decade, because the the number the the, type, the judges and their views on this seem to polarise quite a lot in that decade after Adams. So that's our general decade data. Let's go look at the um, claim compositions. So these are the claims behind them. These aren't the reasons why the disregard of the corporate form occurred. These are just the, the underlying um, basis for the dispute. So um, a statute over there, um, criminal, uh, criminals made up of uh, the kinds of things you'd expect, uh, you know, criminal frauds. Um, and then civil fraud is that category there. Um, contract, you see, is really quite a big area of the underlying claim. Again, uh, probably expected. And tort um, is our sort of biggest one after that. Um, so these are the underlying claims and uh, they're, um, uh, that lead to these uh, decisions having to be made about disregard. And here's the disregard by claim. Uh, probably unsurprisingly, criminal is quite high, statute's pretty high. Um, and fraud is, is very high as well. But the contract tort one, we found that actually in contract they had a, uh, had a smaller rate, or a much smaller rate than a tort, which is contrary to the Mitchell study. We went back, because one of the things you might say is, well, that's of course because you've got a new category of fraud in there. Um, but we went back and we split it, and we, we did put the, we got rid of fraud, and we did it with contract and tort, and we still got these very similar rates that contract was much lower than uh, tort. And that's partly because of the multiple counting within um, Mitchell. Uh, Contract's a big part of these claims, and if you're multiple counting, contract is going to multiple count more than tort. So that's why we mean that the, there's a problem with multiple counting of decision. So uh, that's what we found on the um, uh, disregard by claim. Uh, we then looked at the reasons why. Okay? Um, any of you who have looked at these cases will be puzzled and thinking, how, did you, how does this work? All right? How this works is, and it comes with a big, big health warning, because having read hundreds of these cases, I could not, hand on heart, really tell you what the central rationale for any of those cases really is. It's an area famously full of metaphor and confusion. You get a real sense that they are not saying what they really mean. Okay? Now, um, these were not discrete, so there's no one case I can think of where I can say, oh, well, that was, that was instrumental to it. They tend to be bundled together, 
All right, but so what we've done is, in a highly subjective way, going back to sort of legal skills, we're reading the cases, and we try to categorize them around these broad categories. Now, these are the categories that uh, Bob Thompson in the US used, which we thought fitted still within the UK context. So that's what we use. We try to categorize them this way. Now, um, alter ego, as you can see, is the biggest one. It's also, when you read the cases, the, one, the most meaningless one in some ways. It hides behind, you can hide anything in there. Um, they tend to cluster together. They tend to uh, come in groups. Um, uh, alter ego um, uh, and fraud uh, have a, a sort of unusual relationship, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, but you can see within the uh, disregard, the decisions that they've made to disregard the uh, uh, corporate form and attribute liability to the shareholder, these are, these are the things that, you know, alter ego come in with control domination. Um, and control domination is a funny one because they often, you know, really my sense of the big cases on this was always that they, they don't like to attribute a liability. You know, they, there's a sort of uh, control and domination seems to be at such a high level that actually... Uh, it's difficult to achieve, but within the disregard cases, these, this is uh, something that comes up uh, a significant amount of time. Um, the, we were interested in fraud because it seemed to come up uh, a lot in certain areas. So um, the white there, it's not clear from the labeling, the white is, is where fraud or misrepresentation is not present within the rationale for the disregard. So. Uh, if you look at alter ego, um, when fraud is present along with an alter ego justification, it's got a very, very high uh, disregard rate. <coughs> Where it's not present, um, it's much lower. Uh, control domination, it's 10% you know, lower. Um, but this one's interesting because we had been, Peter and myself, been discussing fraud and, or sorry, fraud as well as uh, facade, sham, shell. Now, it doesn't surprise me that these aren't that different, whether you add fraud or not, because facade and sham shell are a sort of fraud. I mean, to, it, the, the types of issues in, in, with regard to civil fraud uh, seem to be similar. So one of the things that we talked about was whether to actually merge that with into fraud, but we decided not to. But um, uh, there seems to be an element that things that are at play in civil fraud seem to come in to play with facade and sham and shell as well. So we then looked um, uh, at disregard rates by court. So uh, as you can see, um, these are disregard rates for uh, trial court, court of appeal, and um, supreme court. The um, court of appeal is higher. Uh, it does seem to us, given that if you break it down by affirming or reversing, that um, there is an incentive to appeal there's a particular incentive to appeal if you're a corporation because um, if you look, we broke it down by entities and individual shareholders. Um, and as you appeal, the um, disregard rates for entities go down. Uh, and these are mostly group cases. Uh, we don't know why there is that disposition towards production of um, groups because they don't articulate it, uh, but it's definitely in the patterns. So we then became concerned about the judges, or we, were, we, we, we decided when we designed the, um, the, the, the trial for data that we wanted to know about the judges as well because we thought there might be something interesting in there. Um, as we went through it, we did notice that there were certain very prominent judges. Uh, over the course of a judge's career, it is unusual to sit in uh, three cases, really very unusual for a judge, particularly one that was in the post-war period where there's just not many cases. Um, uh, as you can see, um, there's 241 in the final sample, 29, uh, it's only 12% of the total group, and sat in three cases or more. Um, but most of them are in the last 20 years. That's when we have the explosion of, of cases, and of course, that would be logical. Um, but it's still unusual within um, the, the number of judges to sit in three cases. 55% um, within the past decade and 31% still sitting when we finished in um, 2010. So um, we were interested in them. Now I'm going to put up uh, a graphic that if you go on a PowerPoint presentation course, they will say never do this, all right? Um, but I'm going to do this because there's no, I can't find another visual way of explaining 
what we were up to. It's not finished yet. This is the bit of the work in progress where I'm, I'm having problems confirming certain minor things. But in broad sense, you'll sort of see what I mean. All right. <laughs> here, here, are, here are my 29 judges. Um, they, I'll concentrate on the colors for the moment. Okay? Just colors. So I've color coded them by their disregard trends. Okay? So um, uh, the early judges you can see have a tendency to disregard. Um, we move into judges appointed from the 70s onwards, and the reds start to appear. Um, what's significant about the 70s and 80s is the number of judges with a, a zero disregard rate. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And we have you know, some, uh, only one, I think, in the 80s there where uh, they have 100% the other way. And I'll come back to those polarized judges in a moment. But this is a very polarized period in the um, 70s and 80s. And then we move down to more present day judges where the, um, the, the, the real hardcore no disregards disappear um, with the more uh, sort of modern judges. And I'll, I'll break this down a little bit more. But there's a few more things to note. Okay, so in terms of patterns, the green uh, is uh, where they've got a tendency to disregard. The red is where they can see not to. The yellowy, browny bit is where they're on the fence. Um, the other thing to note is um, uh, I was collecting data on whether the significant office was uh, important in any of this, but it turns out not to be. Um, and I'm still collecting individual rates. So these are their case rates, cases they sat in where the outcome was a disregard or no disregard. The other thing to note is the numbers. Okay, so three was unusual. More than three is really uh, very unusual. And if you look at the top, Deming has eight. Now that is extraordinary, given that for 30 years of his career, uh, there aren't many cases. Um, and most of those cases are not as a trial judge, they are in the Court of Appeal. Um, and given his pronouncements in the cases on um, Solomon, he had an agenda in this area. He's also the master of the role, so he can, there's patterns within his cases where he is definitely picking green judges to sit with in his cases. Um, he also sits, because we're only taking the final decisions, he's overruled a lot. Um, he sits in way more cases than H. Uh, and so uh, he's very significant in the way this has sort of, uh, this has played out, we think. Anyway, I'll go back to the general um, uh, data to show you some things. All right, so I've just done a sort of trend graph on this in terms of prominent judiciary. Um, these are the general trends through this. Um, uh, the early judges in the post-war period have a general um, uh, high uh, uh, trend towards disregarding the corporate uh, form. Uh, that does match with the general literature on changes within the court system after the Second World War and the attacks on precedent and the, the battles within the, um, uh, with the Court of Appeal and the uh, House of Lords in this period about the autonomous role of uh, the Court of Appeal. So there's a sort of that generation moving through the court system. Uh, it's not surprising that in the 60s and 70s we see changes in the patterns of litigation around this. Uh, the 60s, we have the beginnings of um, uh, this um, uh, judges who have a, a, dis uh, sorry, a no disregard tendency. And then you can see the neutrals, the um, uh, no disregard. And then in 1989, 1989, when Adams is decided, it's an unusual period. There's a sort of uh, a changing of the guard. The old, earlier judges change over. Um, and it marks a period where there, there's a sort of swing towards um, uh, no disregard. And then you see the 2000s where it comes back again. Um, so if we dig into that a little bit more, and look only at the judges, the, the polarized judges, we see again an interesting pattern. The 70s is fairly even, the 80s is fairly even, apart from 1989 where there's a wave of retirements and um, for the only time within the um, data, the um, strong no disregard, the ones who are totally polarized, who have never uh, disregarded the corporate form, are the majority. 
Uh, if we look at the judges in um, Adams and Cape Industries, we see one of those judges. Uh, the two other judges, um, Slade and Mostel, if we open them up a bit, they didn't ever they didn't sit in three cases. They only sat in two, but both they had a no disregard. So all the judges in Adams have a sort of hundred percent no disregard rate, um, and. Then it changes around in the 1980s and then becomes even more pronounced the return of the uh, judges who have 100% um, uh, disregard rates. Now, um, there's the general patterns along it um, with the whole. You can just see broadly the changes in it over time. And um, if I take you back to um, the observations by decade uh, and we think about the judges now, Again, there's a health warning with this in that you know we're using the uh, prominent judge data to just look at trends. All right, it might not be this at all, but it's a small part of we think it's a small part of the story in terms of uh, reactions. So you have this post-war period with the judges um, where they're changing, where they're much more um, likely to overturn previous decisions. You have the 1966 decision, which only affects the House of Lords, but those of you who know about the history of the um, court system know that Denning took this as a, an opportunity to create an independent role for the Court of Appeal. Um, and he engaged in this battle uh, with the House of Lords for a sort of autonomous decision-making decision role, uh, which went on in this period. Um, uh, it may play a part in the rise of the cases, and certainly Denning's cases all fall in this period. His, um, so his uh, the sort of um, court appeal decisions all in this period. Um, the regs are relatively stable, though. So the, although the, there's a sort of turmoil within the decision-making process, and you have got, you know, year on year, the court of appeal um, and the House of Lords overturning each other, or the court of appeal itself changing its mind on things, particularly in the mid to late 80s. Um, the rates are relatively stable. So um, there's a sort of funny reaction, or Adams may represent a sort of reaction to not the, uh, what, they, what is being generally commented on as the, the disregard rates, because the disregard rates are stable, um, but the sense that the, 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 the precedent system was breaking down, there were problems. And so it may represent a decision to um, close that off and establish some order on this. Uh, and then it has this reaction within the explosion of cases um, and the disregard rate going down. Um, if we add in that the polarization of the judiciary is, occur is affecting this as well, <laughs> this period here particularly sees the rise of uh, our largest group of uh, judges who have a tendency to disregard. Uh, which may play into the decisions we're making. Certainly, this is very unusual within the patterns. Uh, and this is a mistake because I put in some data this morning which dropped it down. You should stop there. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, to sum it all up, um, overall, no disregard tendency. It's fairly over the period, it's a fairly strong one. Um, but not the complete picture. The decade data gives us a better idea. Also, within the data, it's all clumped in the end. It's all clumped in the past 30 years. That's where uh, we've seen this explosion of case law. Um, so we've got a, a sort of historical narrative based around the, the, pre the Solomon, heavy precedent of, um, of Solomon up until the 60s when that goes away. And then we have the beginnings of a, a change um, but it may be a distorted change because of the tensions within the judiciary and the system of precedent. It may also be affected by one judge's, um, uh, you know, one judge pursuing a particular agenda um, in Denning. Um, Adams may then be a sort of overreaction to that, and then we're still seeing this playing out today with reaction and overreaction. Um, our data only goes up to, or this study only goes up to 2009 as a decade study, um, but what we're already seeing with um, the Supreme Court recently in their decisions is a sort of reaction against that very high um, disregard rate um, from uh, 2000 to 2009, or what we may be seeing. Um, we've got an unexplained litigation explosion after Adams, uh, or a sort of, sort of counterintuitive one. Um, the study finds that, uh, contrary to Mitchell and Thomas, that uh, tort uh, had higher uh, disregard rates than contract. 
there's a relationship between rationales, but we're sort of tentative about that because it's um, it's so hard to read really what they they mean when they say things. Um, but we've at least recorded what they say, what they say they mean. Um, we think there's a the appellate courts are creating incentives for plaintiffs uh, to appeal and particularly uh, corporations to appeal. We've got a polarised judiciary, and in some, in all of it, um, one of the things that struck me about it was I thought we were going to be dealing with an established area of law. I thought, you know, it's an old area, we've got loads of cases on it, um, but it really is not a settled area, and it's not an area where real principles are at work here. It feels very much like I thought before we did this, that it was... It's, a, it's an area where there's something going on under it that's just never said. There's, there's sort of a lot of metaphor, as people comment, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and there's a lot of things that we hadn't thought about, like just the dynamics of the court system maybe affecting this. Uh, so um, it doesn't seem to us that it's an established area of law, that we're really dealing with principle. It's one that uh, seems to be caught in a spiral of reaction. All right, that's it. Thank you. Great. Um, I think what we can now is bang on with time, so we have time for questions. Um, can I just ask yep. one initially? So yep. you go back to the one where the total number of cases. Yeah, that, yeah keep going back. Yeah. Yeah, that one. So what was so? Which case reporters were you looking at? And the, here, the, the point I want to get at sure. is. Is it possible that this explosion is a result of simply more cases are being reported than were reported before? Yeah, it could be in there, but we've we've gone through, particularly um, because we had Charles's data, um, uh, which was largely before. But the, you know what, I, what I'm saying is, is it just in the entire English judicial universe that more cases, cases report, yeah. being reported in yeah. 1950, yeah. In 2000 and 1950? Because I, I come across this problem, yeah. and I've done stuff like this, and yeah. it's basically. Are what you capture when you see something like that? Are you simply capturing it because technology's improved? Yeah. And so one thing that might be a useful counter check, can you just show which, which case reports you're looking at? Yeah, let's go back. Sorry, I didn't mean to make it. That's all right, there we go. All right. Would be, so for instance, LexisNexis and Westlaw, now you're looking, I mean, my guess is that in the universe of cases that are available for public looking at is way bigger mm -hmm. in the 19 now yeah. than it yeah. was in the 1950s, even if the number of cases that was actually decided in the 1950s was not that much smaller. Yeah. And you might be capturing simply a case reporting effect. Yeah, yeah. No, you may be right. Um, so, if you, so the way of checking would be is if you could find, put all those together, what would, I mean, not saying you can't do this, but that it may have been that in the 2000, 2009, something like 500,000 cases could be looked at. Yeah. Whereas in the 1970s, you could only find 130,000 yeah. cases. Yeah. And that would explain the time trend. Yeah. It's just, that's an observation. No, 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 we will look at um, uh, how we might filter for that. Um, I know we've discussed it before, I can't remember what we did about it. Um, uh, well, we did try and um, look at as many as we could within those days. Oh, I understand. But, it's just that now, yeah. now trying to find cases and doing searching for cases. Yeah, you can find anything. I know. You, know, um, you just go to the audience. Yeah. Back in the 1970s, it was really yeah. easier. Than yeah. Anything. So, okay. Yeah. Any sure. other? Yeah. Other questions? I think. I don't know if you want to be referee, Alan, or do you want to be a referee? You do it. We'll work our way back. Um, fascinating. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, yeah, I think the practice direction might have something to do with it, but um, Little Woods uh, Stores and IRC was decided by Lord Denning in 1969, mm -hmm. but where he said, we have to watch the uh, Salomon Doctrine very carefully, and I was wondering if that might be the, the, the moment where you get the spike going up. Yeah, uh, but Because that, cause that's yeah, a clear yeah. statement by the Master of the Role saying... Yeah, um, this is the thing, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we can have litigation on the issue. Yeah. Um, uh, just an idea. The, the, the question that I had was about um, the kinds of tort cases that you get. So uh, I, uh, after Chandler and Cape came out, I, I wrote an article or a case note on this, and I looked back at Charles's study, and I, and I went through all the cases looking for whether there was any decision that was related to a personal injury. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of tort, as opposed to a commercial tort, uh, or, or, or rather a, a tort in a commercial context. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't find any. The, the only one being 
uh, Adams and Cape itself, and you know, yeah. was that really taught? Was it the yeah, confidence yeah. of laws? Yeah. Um, and, and and I was wondering if you found any. Because uh, I, I couldn't. Could you find any person? Well, Charles said, I mean, um, uh, Charles discussed that with us as well about the, um, whether that was to do with the likelihood of settlement of those cases was much higher um, because most of them were being brought uh, um, back by unions. Um, so there's a, an element to which settlement in some areas were higher than others. So. That's what Charles, I mean, I think it might have been you triggered Charles discussing it with us, but he thought that that was the reason why. Um, but there aren't many um, personal injury ones in there. Mm. I don't know. Is it the settlement data? I, I don't know. Well, well uh, the, the conclusion that I came to, because if, if you go to the States and you look at bail piercing cases mm -hmm. in the States, I mean, there's, there's tons of personal injury cases. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the taxis hitting people and no. you know, all, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and you know, so so why is it that America has got so many personal injury type tort cases, yeah. and, and Britain never did, and and that seemed to me probably about um, the insurance system in compulsory workplace insurance, <coughs> yeah. the, the NHS. Yeah. You know, you don't need to make it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if 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 you're going to if your medical bills are going to be covered. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, yeah. I, no, this is exactly the same. There aren't many in there. Because and, and also I think the rationale is probably different. You know, the, the case for sort of piercing the corporate bail or ignoring the corporate bail or whatever we're doing with the corporate yeah. bail is much stronger when you've got somebody who's suffered a personal injury uh, yeah. than when you've got um, a commercial um, element to it. Yeah, yeah. Party. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about um, there's a big section of where was um, disregard for statutory reasons. Mm -hmm. So trends in, in statutes that may have authorised and required in the bill. Have you been tracking that? Not really. We were we just tracked it as an underlying decision. So the the claims but is that the one you're talking about? The claims the one where you had that sort of pie chart. Yeah, the pie chart is the claims themselves that yeah. there was a statutory. Um, so you've got a huge I mean, a huge chunk of that statutory, statutory yeah. Tree. So I mean if Parliament is being more or less disposed towards enacting yeah. um, lifting the bill. Yeah, it's true. No, that's it. Um, um, what could that no, that's true. Over time, that might be an interesting thing to track. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, I'll make a note of that and see if we can. Is statute tax? No, we eliminated tax because okay. there was, I mean, it's not tax. it was fine. meaningless. Um, yeah. The amount, yeah. 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 I think Mark is next. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sure. I just wonder, Alan, if where the not quite corporate bail cases would fit in the sample. But that, I mean, cases that everyone kind of thinks of as corporate bail cases, but were ultimately decided on other grounds. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Channel and Cape, Lady Arden says to help, to help with the corporate bail, but you know, we can use duty of care principles or the recent one, Preston Petrodale, yeah. law assumption basically said to help with the corporate bail, we can use trust law. And even, I think you said you excluded tax cases, but round about the time of Solomon, early 1800s, sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s, there were quite a lot of tax cases as well involving tax evasion via the bail. Although it wasn't known as the bail then, yeah. and actually the, the English courts were very liberal, but because they were really approaching it from a taxation rather than a yeah. Well, no, the answer to that is what we were interested in was that they do it. Mm. So what we want to know is it, it substantively have they attributed liability to the shareholder and then work back from that. Yeah. So we capture a lot of those cases because of that. If 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 yeah. what they're so even if they're saying we're not lifting the bail, um, we're doing this instead. Then we've captured that in the data. So would would, would Channel so, and Cape be a disregard thing? Channel and Cape a disregard. Um, no, but uh, pressed would be, if you know what I mean, in in this analysis. Yeah. So yeah. Chandler. Chandler, let me think. I can't remember. You've got agency. Said. You had agency in there as a disregard. Yeah, but Adams they say no. I, I think Adams goes in there as no disregard. Yeah, but on your kind of other thing, you, agency is categorised as one example of disregard. So As, uh, it is justified in some cases, yeah, it's the yeah. lowest disregard one, yeah. yeah. But the channeling would be disregard, would it, even though it was a tort basis for the decision? Chandler and Cape, yeah, I think so. I think it is in the data as a disregard. Okay. So you it's think it's, it's not a... Yeah, work yeah. back from it, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it is, they do lift it a lot. I mean, the outcome is to lift, but the rationales are so hidden. 
And even where they explicitly say, we are not doing this, but we are attributing liability to the shareholder. If you exclude those cases, then you lose a lot of the richness of it because it's so hidden. Richard? Yeah, I, I, two points really. Uh, to go back to the, the statute thing, I mean, I, I just wanted to give you give a bit more detail as to what you're actually counting as statutes and whether you're discounting the manager liability. So I think about section 214, which isn't listing the name, it's manager liability, whether, whether you're discounting the manager liability in the statute. And just on the crime point, I mean, I know crime is 90% on that, but on your next slide, I think it's crime at a very high disregard rate, so it could have quite a, a, a significant impact on, on the overall result. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm kind of interested in what you mean by criminal, because I, mean, I don't think anyone would ever say that the corporate veil is there to, to mask a crime. So if you're talking about people being fraudulent, the extent to which you can actually regard crime as an example of lifting the veil, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure at all, because I don't think you'd ever say that the corporate veil was there to protect people who were committing fraud or committing criminal offences. So um, I'm wondering if you give, give a bit more detail to what you mean by, by, by crime. So the criminal ones, there are a lot of, of criminal cases that are um, uh, uh, sort of fraud, actual fraud, um, uh, criminal, and then there's a separate bunch which are civil. Uh, which are where fraud is a, a part of the uh, the claim brought, but it's um, it might be fraudulent misrep, it might be uh, uh, elements of deceit, but they're 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 in the cases themselves. Um, the the criminal ones are there's just a range of um, uh, what would broadly be a, a fraud. I, you know, I can't break them all down, but there's a yeah, lot of them I mean, that fall into just broad yeah. fraud categories. I mean, I'm not really sure I'd regard fraud as a, a lifting the veil in a sort of traditional set, because you know, the sound principle is, is not about protecting people who are being, being fraudulent. So whether you could, whether I, I, I don't think I'd actually count that as really an example of sort of lifting the veil in the way that it, it, it sort of traditionally... Yeah, is. but it does occur in the criminal context, so the the sort of if we're looking at the claim. All right, so you've got to separate out the basis of the, how we got to court and from the reasons that they're doing it. So um, all we're noting in the claim data is to just say, these are the background um, uh, elements of the cases, and then layered on top of that are the rationales for which they said they were lifting the veil. The suggestion is, and again, this is in, uh, not just in our uh, the suggestion is that there is a connection somehow between the underlying claim and the, the clouding of the rationales or sometimes the direct rationales they would, might give. Um, but there might not be. It's just that the Thompson study very early on had this um, uh, finding that in, in contract they were more likely to uh, if the claim was contract, it was more likely that they would lift. Now, they may not be connected at all, but really the spiral of um, uh, empirical studies since then has been focused on, in, in a way, we have to note the underlying claims and uh, the rationales, but they may not be connected at all. You may well be right. The, um, why does it matter that it started out as a criminal um, part or a criminal claim? Uh, it, is that related to why they disregard? But they, when it does start out as a criminal claim, the disregard rates are high. We should probably end here because people have to go to class, and I have this lingering since someone actually opened the door. I'm feeling that someone will need the room. Um, but I'm, I, I, well, I don't want to speak for Alan, but I'm going to try anyway. I anticipate if we step outside and you have questions you'd like to ask, mm -hmm. that would be uh, to those. Yeah. So thanks, Alan, thank you, Wayne.